you turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 7 as we continue our series on the book of Hebrews, my subject tonight, the everlasting priesthood, part two. The everlasting priesthood. We saw earlier that Jesus has taken us beyond the veil, that he has taken us into the holiest of holies by a new and a living way. Only uh, the high priest under the Aaronic priesthood could go behind the veil. But Jesus has taken us there. Jesus is the way. And as our great high priest, he has gone behind or within the veil for us into the heavenly tabernacle itself. And that's what the writer Paul is showing us in the book of Hebrews. As our forerunner, Jesus guarantees that we will be with him when he comes. And in chapter 7, we learn that Jesus is a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And as such, he has a continuing priesthood. He ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. The Arianic priesthood, those men, they died and another priest would take their place. And so we've been looking into this mystery and considering how great this man Melchizedek was and we found that it was not, the greatness was not in the fact of who he was as a man, but the role that God gave him. We'll pick up our reading tonight at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12. For this priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity to change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. And it is yet far more evident that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testified, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He's quoting Psalms 110, verse 4. Look at verse 18, Psalms, uh, Hebrews 7, 18. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and the unprofitability thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did by the which we draw nigh to God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made a priest, none of this happened without an oath. The priesthood of Jesus was established with an oath for God, is what the writers say. Verse 21, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by himself that saith unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Again, he is quoting Psalms 110, verse 4, when the Holy Ghost spoke through the psalmist David, and David penned these words. Verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety or the guarantee of a better covenant. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered or allowed to continue by reason of death. The priest under the Arianic priesthood, they died. But this man, because he continued forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore? He is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Talking about Jesus. Who need not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once. When he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmities, but the word of an oath, talking about Psalms 110 again, which was since the law, maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. The psalmist wrote, After the law was given and penned the words, Thou art a high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. And that's what the writer is saying here. Tonight I want to talk to you about the everlasting priesthood of Christ, part two. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for the word of God. 
Lord, I pray once again that you will pull the veil back off of our minds, that you will let us see the more excellent way that we have, the new and the better covenant, that we will see how we are invited as individuals to come and have fellowship with you, to come into the very presence of the throne room because of what Jesus Christ has done, and he has gone behind the veil as a forerunner for us, making the way open unto us. And you say, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, where we may obtain grace and mercy to help in our time of need. Bless us tonight. Illuminate our hearts and our minds. Thank you for the anointing to preach. And everyone said in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hebrews seven twelve. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of whom no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, he's the line of the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. So there is a radical difference between the priesthood of Aaron and this new order after the order of Melchizedek. And if you're going to live a victorious Christian life, you must understand this. The devil is always trying to get us back under the law. Paul wrote to the Galatians, said, Oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Did you receive this new life through the hearing of the law or by the keeping of faith and by the Spirit? And so the devil is always trying to get us to to try to justify ourselves by our good works. Always go back to the cross. Your victory and your anointing and the things you will get from God, they are at the cross in the finished work of Christ. And then we go on to see him as our great high priest who paid it all at Calvary. And he's alive. He's at the, in the heavenly holiest of holies interceding for us right now. So the Levitical priests, they were descendants of Jacob, the son of Levi. All Levite males from the ages of 20 to 50, they were to use in some form of service in that priesthood. And the high priest had to be a descendant of Aaron. The high priest was to offer sacrifices first for his sins and then for the sins of the people on the Day of Atonement. And on that day, the high priest went behind the veil to offer those sacrifices. He could only go there once a year. No one else could go into the holiest of holies. No one except the high priest was allowed to go behind the veil. And so now the writer of Hebrews, Paul, is saying that Christ is indeed a priest not after the order of Levi, but after the order of another priesthood, Melchizedek. And the place Melchizedek occupies in the scriptures, it is remarkable. Melchizedek was a historical person and purposely intended by God to be a type of Christ. Nothing is recorded of his beginning that would qualify him for the priesthood. He is without genealogy. He is without descendant. And we have no record of him ever transferring his priesthood to anyone else. He just appears on the scene in Psalms 110. Well, actually, he appears first on the scene in uh, Genesis chapter 14, where Abraham paid tithe in that three verses there that talk about Melchizedek. And then after the law was given, the psalmist penned in Psalms 110, the Lord swear and will not repent thou art a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So he has no genealogy, nothing that qualifies him under that Arianic priesthood to be a priest, but he is spoken of there by the Holy Ghost to let us know another priesthood is coming, a greater priesthood, because the Arianic priesthood was not first. The priesthood of Melchizedek was first, and you can pick it up in Genesis chapter 14. So his greatness was not in who he was, but in the office and in the role that God granted him being a type of Christ. A preacher, an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, 
His greatness is not in who he is. His greatness is in who God, his God who called him to do what he did. And if he's an anointed vessel of God, he is sent to the body of Christ to be a blessing to the body. It's not that he's greater than anyone in the body. It's the office God put him in that makes him greater. Just like God put him, Melchizedek in this office as a top type of Christ, it made him greater than Aaron, greater than the law, greater than the angels, greater than Abraham, the patriarch, because of the role God had given Melchizedek. And you need to understand that. That'll help you understand the fivefold ministry God has placed in the church. But this man was a priest, and he had a priesthood before the priesthood of Aaron was ever established under the law. And just as we see Abraham as the father of the faithful, we need to see Melchizedek as a type of Christ. Let me say that again. Just as we see Abraham as the father of the faithful, we need to see Melchizedek as a type of Christ. Look at Hebrews 7, 15. And it is yet far more evident, for after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testified, God testified, the Holy Ghost, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Aaron's priesthood was ordained by God under the law. God gave Moses the law at Mount Sinai, and he set up a priesthood, and a tithe was paid to that priesthood to get God's people into the seed time harvest time principle, and so there would be a priesthood to minister to the need of God's people. They were chosen people. So Aaron's priesthood was ordained by God under the law. That phrase, not after the law of a carnal commandment, that does not refer to something that is evil. That refers to something that is weak, something that is frail, something that is human. The, the order was set up by God, but it was passed down through humans, through people that were weak. The phrase, but after the power of an endless life, that refers to the Holy Ghost, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. So Jesus was made a priest uh, after the order of Melchizedek and not after the weak Arianic order, but by the power of an endless life. And you need to understand that because you need to know that right now in heaven you have access to go into the very throne room of God through a new and a better way through the blood of Jesus. That's why the cross is so important that we always keep the, the cross as a focal point that people that teach, you know, you don't need the cross. Let me tell you, without the cross, we have no, no, there's, there's, there's no life. Jesus poured out his life, and he died and was raised from the dead to atone for our sin. And that's how, why we have the life of God. So don't ever let anybody take you there. Amen. That people teach all kind of things. But the phrase, for he testified thou art a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, that pertains to the word of God. That God proclaimed that. The Holy Ghost spoke through David. In Psalm 110, verse 4, that now if you go back and, and do a, a word search, you'll find that the term priest is first used in Genesis chapter 14 when Melchizedek appears on the scene. You will find there are three verses there, Genesis 18, 19, and 20, I believe, but you can check it out. And in Psalm 110, verse 4, that is the only four times that this man is spoken about in the Old Testament. And, and, and they, Israel should have known, and I covered this in another lesson, that Abraham was justified by faith long before the law. And, and the Bible tells us in Hebrews 4, unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached to them did not profit them. Why? Because Israel did not mix faith with the word that was preached. What they wanted to do was go under the law of a carnal commandment. What they wanted to do was works. Well, God did require some works, 
But had they believed God, they would have been justified just like Father Abraham. How did we get justified? Romans 5 and 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are justified by faith in the finished work of Calvary. And God let Abraham see that. David saw that. He said, Thou will not suffer his soul to be left in hell. These prophets of old, they will see us. And they penned the word of God. And God was trying time and time again to speak to that nation. Now look at us. God speaks to us time and time again. And we go out of the church. We never come to the altar like we should and pour out our hearts to God and say, God, what are you trying to teach me? Some people come for the music. Some come for half the preaching. Some come and they never come to the altar and allow the word of God to change them. The whole object of the word of God is to change us into the image of Jesus Christ. And if you miss that, then you'll be like Israel. You'll wander through your wilderness. You'll just wander and wander around the same old mountain for 40 years. And if you make it in, well, you know, some of them didn't. Only two of them made it out of that wilderness experience. Amen. And then those desert babies that were born, they had faith. You find faith in some strange places. Some people in the church, they, they got saved, and that's what they do with their faith. They never go on with their faith. And then somebody else comes in, and they get saved, and, and my God, they, they, they begin to search the Word of God, and they begin to study, and all of a sudden they begin to grow, and they become strong in the Lord, and signs and wonders begin to follow them. Well, let me get back to my lesson. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul was quoting Psalms 110, verse 4. I want you to look at this because over, this is about the fifth or sixth time he has said this in this one letter, or up to this point. Psalms 110, verse 4. It says, The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Holy Ghost had spoken and declared that the high priesthood of Christ and that the priesthood of Aaron would be changed into the order after Melchizedek. And so the word of God is irrefutable. That's what the apostle is saying here. He said, the holy, that's why he keeps going back to that one phrase, that the Lord swear. He will not repent. He will not take it back. And this is what's so important. Now look at, at verse uh, 18, Hebrews 7:18. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitability thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did by which we draw nigh to God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made a priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this, talking about Jesus, with an oath by him, that he saith unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Again, he is quoting what the Holy Ghost said. Paul is driving his point home, letting these people that where the Judaizers had come in and they were, they were drifting away from God, and then they got to falling away from God. He said, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And they they are wanting to go back under the law. The, the Judaizers have come in and trying to tell them that the old was better. And, and Paul is driving the point home and says, no, that ended at Calvary. What is better is the new priesthood after the order of Melchizedek where Christ cut a covenant with his own precious blood. And now he has entered into heaven itself. And, and so just like there are people today that don't want to believe certain things about the Bible, the apostle, he's dealing with people just like that who are drifting away from God. And they, they, he, he says that, you, you know, that, that some of them, that they go so far away from God that they crucify the Son of God afresh. So what he's letting us know are two things. First of all, you will always have to go back to the cross. You, no one ever gets away from the cross. And then you will have to go on from the cross into the holiest of holies to obtain the great treasures that belong to us as children of God. And he's showing that Jesus 
has made this new and this better way through his own precious blood. He is a new priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. And because of that, not only can just Aaron go behind the veil, you and I, we can go behind the veil. We can go in the holiest of holies, into the very presence of God. And we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that is our forerunner that has gone in there before us. And now he invites us to come boldly to the throne. Why? Because of the blood. Because of what was paid for our redemption. And his blood gives us access into the every grace of God. Everything that you'll ever get comes out of what was done at the cross and the fact that Jesus was raised a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. An unending priesthood. That's what he is saying. So the writer is letting us know that the law was completely disannulled. It was completely abolished at the cross. When Jesus gave himself as the final sacrifice under the law. This refers to three laws. The civil law, the ceremonial law, and the moral law. So the moral law, the Ten Commandments, they are God's eternal laws. But man could not keep them. So there had to be someone that could keep them. And Jesus was tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin. He kept every one of the moral laws. He never committed a sin. He was tempted just like us, but he was qualified to pay redemption's price because he submitted himself and his will completely to that of the Father, even to the death of the cross. So he kept the Ten Commandments perfectly. He satisfied all of its demands by the sacrifice of himself. The law demanded death as a penalty, and Jesus satisfied that demand by his death on the cross. He died for you and me. He took our place. He was our substitute. Look at Colossians 2, 14, what Paul said. He said, he died blotting out the handwriting of the ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. He nailed it. You are free forever. Hallelujah. All you've got to do is get his life in you and be obedient to what the Father says, and you can walk in victory, and there are not enough devils in hell to stop you, and the big devil himself cannot stop you, because you, the hand, go on praising the handwriting of the ordinance that was against you, contrary to you, Jesus nailed it to the cross and freed you forever because he satisfied every demand of the law. We couldn't do it, so he did it for us. And so the Arionic priesthood was a figure of the work that Jesus would do on earth. It was temporal, it was not eternal, and it was disannulled at the cross. Amen. And at the cross, Jesus gave himself as the final sacrifice under the law. He completely satisfied the demands of the law, and the Arionic priesthood ended right there. And he established a new and a better priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Hallelujah. See, the scriptures plainly tell us that as believers, we are dead to the law. But notice this, the scriptures do not say that the law is dead. It says we are dead to the law. It does not say the law is dead. The, the law, the moral law is very much alive and the demands of it are very much alive for all of humanity. The moral law cannot change. It is impossible. They are God's eternal laws. If it was a sin to steal 3,000 years ago, it is still a sin to steal today. And the same goes for lying, the same goes for murder, the same goes for adultery, or any other of the Ten Commandments. Now I'm going to preach to you. It's just like the Lord's Day. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thy labor and do all thy work. But the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do no work. Amen. Now our culture has gotten away from acknowledging the sanctity of the Lord's day. 
and people treat it just like any other day. But we need to pause one day in seven and come away from our pursuit of profit and pleasure and focus on those things that build character, that build holiness, and that build godliness into our hearts and into our lives and into the culture and the society in which we live. And that's better preaching than what you're acknowledging right now. Amen. Amen. Let me give you what Jesus said. If you just don't, if you don't think I'm on good solid ground, let me tell you something. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man, he said, is Lord of the Sabbath. That's what Jesus said. And by that, he meant we need one day of rest every week, and that day is the Lord's day, the day he rose from the dead. That's what we celebrate now. I know we celebrate it every time we come together, but God put a law in order saying that your body is going to get tired. Your mind is going to get tired. You're in this world. You're not of the world. Your citizenship is in heaven. Amen. You're not of the world. You're in the world. And Jesus prayed in John 17, Father, keep them from the evil of the world. But your body, my body, and anybody's body, even Jesus had to rest his body. And we have to come apart, you know, before we come apart. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, we do. We need to rest our body, and that's why God put an eternal law out there to remember the Sabbath day. God rested on the seventh day, and he wants us to rest from our labor and enter into his rest. And that's a whole lot better preaching than people will acknowledge. I know it's not popular. Go on, praise God. It's the truth right out of the word of God. Hallelujah. So, therefore, wisdom. When I pin those words, I put wisdom in a capital W. Wisdom. You want to know what wisdom is? Read the first uh, seven chapters of Proverbs where God begins to speak. Wisdom hath declared. Wisdom has said. Therefore, wisdom tells me that we need to rest the natural man and strengthen the inner man, the hidden man of the heart. We need to rest on the Lord's day, come to church, hear the word of God, Get the inner man strong because guess what? Monday morning's coming and we're going out there into a world of sin and darkness and we're to be a light full of the Holy Ghost, full of the fire of God and full of the power of God. And you cannot do that by giving yourself over to carnality and to the culture that we live in. God help the church to wake up. Okay. The flesh no longer dominates us because Christ now rules in our heart. Amen. Look at Galatians 3.24. The apostle Paul said, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Look at this. But after faith has come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. Okay? We, that means we are dead to the law and no longer under the schoolmaster of the law, but we're justified now by faith in the finished work of Christ. And the moral law that Jesus kept, we're to keep. We couldn't do it, so he did it for us. And then he put a new life in us, so we'll have his power, his glory, and his anointing to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. So your life is the sum total of the choices you make. And if you choose to be carnal, God will let you be carnal. If you choose to be a sinner, God will let you live in sin. If you choose to pray, God will let you pray. If you choose not to pray, God will not force you to pray. God will not force you to come to church. God will not force you to tithe. God will not force you to obey him. God will not force any sinner to come and serve him. God gives man a choice, and he says, Choose you this day, each and every day, whom you will serve. Amen. Amen. As for me and my house, Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. I made a decision a long time ago. I don't care what others in the church do. I don't care what the culture does. 
As for me and my house, I choose to serve God. I don't care how carnal other people become. I don't care how far away they go from God. I don't care whether or not revivals come and people come to church during revivals. I made a decision. I chose something. I chose Jesus. And I'm going to feed the inner man, the hidden man of my heart. Glory to God. And I'm going to grow in grace and knowledge. And I have chosen to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Why? Because there's a battle coming. There's a battle raging. And you had better be suited up and battle ready at all times. None of us know what tomorrow brings. I just know who holds tomorrow. And I know he holds my hand. That's a whole lot better preaching than you hear on TV. I promise you that. Amen. The Bible says, let, let another praise thee and not thine own self. <laughs> so I reckon I have to let somebody else do it. Amen. We're dead to the law, no longer under the schoolmaster, justified by faith. And Christ has satisfied all the demands of the law, and he has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. What a Savior. Look, look at Romans 6 and 11. Paul said, Likewise, reckon ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Holy Ghost did not say that the sin nature was dead, but we are dead to sin, and we are not ruled by sin any longer. Amen. Sin no longer has dominion over us because Christ now rules in our heart, and we want to please God just like Jesus wanted to please God. The Christ that is in us, he longs, and he wants us to seek after righteousness. He said, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. And you cannot fill yourself carnality on the Lord's day and think you're going to walk in the Spirit. I cannot do it. You cannot do it. No one can do it. Whatever you feed in your life, that is what is going to be dominant. So feed yourself the Word of God. Come back to church on Sunday. Hallelujah. Amen. See, sin no longer has dominion over us. Because Christ now rules in our heart. The sin nature is present, but it no longer dominates our lives. Look at Romans 6 and 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. I got it, brother. He said, Know ye not that who you yield yourself servant to obey? His servants you are, whether sin unto death, or obedience unto righteousness. So, we have to have this desire fed, and you and I, it's our responsibility to feed it. The Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You can't work mine out, I can't work yours out. I can stand as a prophet of God, I can proclaim the word of God to you. What you do with it, that's up to you entirely. The Bible says so. I'm not your judge, I will not be your final judge, I will not say Anything to you on the day of judgment, the one whose eyes are like a flaming fire, whose hair is white like snow, who has a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, Jesus Christ, he will look at some people and say, depart from me, you evil workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I'm going to tell you, it's a lot more to this thing than some people preach nowadays. That was a lot more dear, dear, yeah, dear, done at the cross than what some people realize. I mean, that was a tremendous price paid for our salvation. But Paul clearly let, tells us that the potential to sin still exists in the heart and the lives of the greatest Christian. None of us are wearing halos yet. There is no believer who has ever lived that has not had trouble with the sin nature. I'll say that again. There is no believer who has ever lived that has not had trouble with that old sin nature. The danger of sin still lurks there, which makes us even more dependent upon Jesus Christ and the finished work of the cross. And that's why Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow. Uh, put, uh, Put up uh, Luke 9, 23. Luke 9, 23. I want you to see that because it's a daily walk. 
It's not a one-time encounter that I go to the cross. It's something I must do every day of my life. I've got to go back and thank him and praise him and say, Lord, I'm in this world. I'm not of it. My citizenship is in heaven, but I'm going through some perilous territory. I'm going through some places, God, where there's sin. But the Bible says we're sin that abound, and we know it does all around us. Grace does much more abound. So I'm counting on God's grace, not my good works. That's what, what I'm trying to say. He said unto him, this is Jesus, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross once in a while. Daily? Does it say daily? Daily and follow me. Now, that's Jesus preaching. That's some real good preaching there. That's Jesus preaching. Amen. So, we are new creatures in Christ. We're partakers of God's divine nature. And as such, we are no longer ruled and dominated by that old sin nature. At the cross, Jesus gave himself as the final sacrifice under the law. And he completely satisfied all the demands of the law. He took his blood into the heavenly holiest of holies. He went behind the veil right there to the very throne room of God, placed his blood on the mercy seat. God the Father looked down at the final sacrifice of the Arianic priesthood, his son Jesus, brought the gavel of justice down, said, it is done. There'll never be any other requirement. It was all done by his son at Calvary. And when the Father sees the blood, glory to God, and Jesus points him to it. No matter what the devil says about you, the blood has declared your victory. Hallelujah. Go and praise God for the blood. Amen. And so the Arianic priesthood, it was a figure of the work that Jesus would do on earth as the final sacrifice under the law. The Melchizedek priesthood, however, it was a figure of the work that Jesus would do in heaven. Behind the veil. Look at uh, Hebrews 7, 21. For those priests were made without an oath. But this with an oath by him that saith unto him that the Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek. He just keeps driving this on. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better covenant. And they truly were many priests because they were not allowed to continue by reason of death. When Aaron died, his son Eleazar became the high priest. And so it went right on down. Then it got so bad that people started paying money for the priesthood. See, that's how wicked man's heart is. That's why we must come back to him and go back to the cross. And we must go and examine, let a man examine his own heart. What the Bible says, you can't examine mine. I can't examine yours. The, the, the searchlight of the Holy Ghost, he's the one that does it. And that's the word of God. That's the preaching of the word of God. And that's why the altar is so important to every Christian. When, when we look at the priesthood of Aaron, it is a priesthood of death. The high priest died. Christ died for us. Amen. But as the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, he is the surety of or the guarantee of a new and a better covenant, and he ever liveth to make an accession for us. So our sins were paid for by Christ on the cross, and now we see a cross that is empty. We see a Christ that is at the right hand of the throne of God, our great high priest that is passed into the heavens. He died for us so now that he can live his life in us. And he can direct us and guide us by the power of the Holy Ghost. What a plan. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost working together for our redemption and for our victory. Now, every creature acts according to the life that is in it. The bird does not need a law to command it to fly. Because it has the life of a bird within it and because of that it acts like a bird a fish does not need a law to command it to swim because it has the life of a fish within it it acts like a fish and likewise the Christian does not need a law to command them not to sin it has the life of God within them 
They are partakers of God's divine nature, and we are to act according to the life that is working within us. Amen. And the Christian who trusts Christ as his Redeemer and as his life, it will be their great delight to do God's will. No one will have to force you. No one will have to say it's time to go to church. No one will say, have to say it's time to pray. No one will have to tell you that it's time to read your Bible. That is an inner law that's working in you. And there's a life working in you. It is the life of Jesus Christ himself. And that life that's in you, just like he was willing to submit to God, that life causes you and me and all of the Christians and every believer to submit to God. So let me give you some scripture for that. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Christ in you, the hope of glory. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And it goes on to say, for what the law could not do in its weak through the flesh, God sent his own son. And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So that's the mystery God had hidden for ages. The born-again Christian has the law of the spirit of life working in them. And it's just natural for them to delight to do God's will because the life of Christ is working in them. God's great purpose, and this will blow you away, God's great purpose for us is not just forgiveness of sin. His great purpose for us was fellowship with him. You need to listen carefully to this. God's great purpose was not just to forgive us of our sins. No. His great purpose was that we could have fellowship with him. Now, the priesthood of Aaron could go no further than the forgiveness of sins. Once a day, once a year rather, he went behind the veil and he made a sacrifice before he went behind that for himself, for the sins of the people. And then he went into the holiest of holies. So the priesthood of Aaron could go no further than forgiveness. But as our great high priest, Jesus, after the order of Melchizedek, Christ has opened up a new and a living way into God's presence to where we can have continual fellowship with the Father. That's why John writes, these things write we unto you, you might have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. If you go back into our fellowship hall, that scripture is on the wall. It's on there because we want to have fellowship with one another, people of like precious faith. We want to have fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. John said that's the kind of fellowship we want to have. Amen. So, look at Hebrews 7.24. But this man, Jesus, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The priests under the old covenant died simply because they were mortal men. That's why they died. It's appointed unto men but wants to die, and after that the judgment. But this man, Christ Jesus, after he completed the finished work of the cross, God raised him from the dead because he was a perfect sacrifice. And now he ever liveth as our great high priest that has passed into the heavens. He has a continual, unchangeable priesthood. And what he is today, he will be tomorrow and forevermore. What Jesus he has an unchangeable priesthood. What he is today, he will be tomorrow and forevermore. Some people say, the days of miracles are over. There's never been a day of miracles. There is a God of miracles. People say, he still heals. He's always healed. He will always heal. What he is today, he will be tomorrow and forever. He shed his precious blood at Calvary, so whosoever would call upon his name could be saved. There's power in the blood of Jesus. 
Those old saints wrote some beautiful songs about it. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I, I like that new one. You know, the blood of Jesus washes me. The blood of Jesus sets me free. What a sacrifice he gave his life. Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me. Woo! Glory! Go on, praise him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Tell you what. Amen. Jesus addressed all of man's sins in the atonement. He left nothing undone. And while in fact it is done, the finished work of the cross can only be appropriated by those who exercise their faith in him. That's a powerful statement there. It is a fact that Jesus paid it all at Calvary. It is done. But the benefits of the cross can only be appropriated by those who place their faith in his blood and the finished work of the cross. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. It's the finished work of the cross that gives us access to God and his amazing grace. The cross was and is the means by which we receive anything and everything from God. Don't let the devil ever try to get you to try to get anything from God by your good works. Go back to the, to the cross. Go back to Calvary. Take the blood back to where Jesus paid the sacrifice, stripped the devil of his power, and gave us his amazing grace and access into God's throne. Amen. Christ suffered for all, bearing our sins in his own body on the tree and healing us by his stripes. Pastor Nick, he is able to save, one man said, from the guttermost to the uttermost. He was made a curse for us on the tree that we might receive the blessings of Abraham by faith. Look at Hebrews 7, 26. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Wow. Woo! I'll tell you, that's good. Who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice for his own sins and then for the people. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Wow. So it took the precious, pure, holy blood of Jesus to redeem us from all sin. The sacrifice that he made accomplished once and for all a perfect redemption for you and me and for the whole world. His blood has satisfied the sin issue forever. When he cried from the cross, it is finished, he had satisfied forever the demands of God's holy law. And now he is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, whose person and priesthood and work are all in the power of an endless life. Look at Hebrews 7.28. Because he ever lives to make intercession for us, he is able to save us completely and give us full fellowship with the Father. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. But the word of an oath, wow, which was since the law, he's talking about, Psalms 110, verse 4 again. Make it the Son who is consecrated forever. Thus Jesus, he fulfilled two of the Old Testament prophecies here in chapter 7. Psalms 2, 7 said, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. And Psalms 110, verse 4 said, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Some wonderful treasures the Holy Ghost is wanting to share with us out of the Word of God. I encourage you to go back. You can go on live stream. You can go out uh, 
to YouTube and Google Jerry R. Nelson, pull all these sermons up. You can listen to them over and over again, and you can ask the Holy Ghost. Get your Bible out. Read it with it. I cannot tell you the hours of study I have put into this, but it's exciting to me, and I'm like a bird. You know, i got a lot to do at this season of the year, but it's like this. I'm trying to get back to my office, back to my study, so I can delve into the Word of God in the book of Hebrews. I encourage you to go read your Bible, to pray, to get these sermons, Get somebody else's commentary. Get somebody else's sermons if you can find them. Don't just go by what I'm giving out, but there are wonderful treasures that are in this book. And the writer, the Apostle Paul, he's bringing so many of his epistles into focus and bringing the Old Testament into focus and showing us a beautiful picture of our Savior and our great high priest, Jesus Christ, who ever liveth to make intercession for us. Let us stand. Hallelujah. Messiah. 